Well, hey folks, uh, Sunday afternoon, I finally feel well enough to do a little bit of uh, interaction with uh, Sharon Betcher and the spirit and the politics of disablement. I'm gonna jump right in um, to the chapter, putting my foot down. She has some, some of her more uh, explicitly theological stuff going on here. Page 99, right in the middle, she's been um, uh, sort of, you know, criticizing um, certain Christian expressions of um, uh, basically of maintaining purity of kinds. She uses the phrase about five lines down. But I'm going to go down to the uh, next paragraph. So she says, if certain trajectories of Christianity have been invested in maintaining clearly distinct taxonomic, and taxonomy has to do with basically how we arrange things in groups, um, something like that, uh, a clearly distinct taxonomic kindship uh, rather than kinship. It'd be like that which is like my kind, we go together, and that which is not like my kind goes over there. This does not sum up the Christian project, this kind of we'll say divisiveness in a sense. One of the earliest baptismal formulas known to Christianity articulated a commitment to the formation of a heterogeneous, uh, which would mean um, other, hetero meaning other, and not, yeah, genus, heterogeneous, um, other groups, different kinds of, of groups, we'll say. A heter heterogeneous community held together with pneumatic, that is, spiritual energy. That is, she quotes from Galatians, in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. I wasn't going to comment on this, but I have to real quick. Um, even, even in this statement, sort of, I say, I'll say ironically, She's quoted it as it often is translated in Christ, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but in the Greek. And some of you, I think, have heard me talk about this. Uh, Paul actually writes, in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, no male and female. In other words, and we can't read his mind. We don't know what's going on there. But Paul shifts from the neither nor of the first two pairs, and then in the third pair, which is male, female, many translators just follow the neither nor, but in the Greek, he actually does change it. Is it just like to change it up, uh, to break up the, the monotony? I doubt it. Um, can't prove it. That's the problem. But, but it is significant that Paul goes from neither Jew nor Greek neither slave nor free, to no male and female. So that even here, the sort of sameness, in a sense that she's criticizing as her big point, is, is even under, uh, what's a good word here, kind of uh, deconstructed with this these three pairs when the third pair does not follow the uh, grammatical construction of the first two. Now, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it is interesting, and it does raise questions of, like, if Paul really actually intended this shift, then why? And um, someday maybe we can interview him and ask. As St. Augustine reminds us, even then we'll have to interpret the words that he says. Maybe different in the world to come, I don't know, maybe... We won't be so bound by interpretation, which I think is a great thing to be bound by right now. But uh, in any case, um, I've come to believe that uh, because Paul is talking about a baptismal, it is definitely a baptismal formula, and it is about being uh, uh, initiated through baptism into basically the new creation, the, the community of the new creation, i.e. the church that Paul actually may well be reaching back to Genesis 1, where we read that Adam uh, created in God's image male and female, okay? Male and female. 
if Paul is commenting in on that in some way and saying no male and female, clearly in all these cases, he's not saying, well, in the church, there's no longer Jew, Jewish people and non-Jewish people, no longer people who are slaves and 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 uh, and no longer people who are free. He is saying that these categories are no longer determinative of um, like our primary identity as followers of Christ and and members of the body of Christ. But um, perhaps more crucially, with the no male and female, I wondered if. Uh, Paul may be breaking up sort of the tendency, uh, especially in his own time, and especially as a Pharisee, and especially as a man, uh, the typical reading of Genesis 1, Adam is male and female, would have quite immediately assigned particular, you know, roles slash identities to male and female, so that the coupling male and female is a uh, very intentional, has kind of intentional built-in uh, expectations. Genesis 1 doesn't necessarily have those. In fact, in Genesis 1, uh, you may recall, um, Adam, as male and female, you know, humanity as male and female, is addressed by God as a whole. That is, in principle, you and I are also there. All human beings are addressed in Genesis 1. Uh, more to the point, in terms of Genesis 1, God does not say, okay, uh, male, here's your job, here's your responsibility, here's your role, here's, here's who you're supposed to be. And then female, I have a different set of expectation roles and identity for you. So uh, while Genesis 1 doesn't say that, I want to say again, Genesis 1 doesn't uh, sort of split these into two different um, categories of expectation or role, you can bet that subsequent Jewish interpretation of Genesis 1 did exactly that. So my best guess, and it is a guess, is that Paul is saying in Christ, no, it's, it's not like neither male nor female, and it's not no male and no female, it's no male and female as in no longer those locked in identities, expectations. Now that may seem a little, I don't know, might even seem a little radical. I don't know, I think this is a very radical statement. In any case, uh, Betcher, and that would have probably taken her too far afield, but I, I thought that's worth mentioning. Now, back to that text, or back to her text. Baptismal commitments to an adopted spirit family uh, an affinity group, certainly not a nuclear family, or any kind of biological kinship network. And then she has a, a reference to Matthew. It's probably where Jesus uh, says, who is my mother? Uh, who are my brothers and sisters? And he, and he designates those that are listening to him as he teaches. Uh, Here is my mother and my brothers and sisters those who hear the word of God or the will of God and put it into practice. So no longer biological kinship, as she's saying. Specifically, uh, this, this kind of idea of family, of kinship, specifically precluded soteriological, that is, re, re, relating to salvation, exclusivism, so kind of an exclusivist understanding of salvation based in the delineation of kinds, K-I-N-D-S. In fact, um, one might even wonder if she, one of those kinds might be like saved and unsaved. I don't want to put words in her mouth. In her mouth. In fact, the key salvific figure here, Jesus as Christ, was considered a hybrid, uh, both divine and human. Of course, and she talks about that. Now, uh, I'm going to go on to the next paragraph because um, uh, we, you need to learn a little bit about Athanasius, even if it's just this little bit here. According to the 4th century theologian Athanasius, very important 4th century theologian, by the way, of Alexandria, whose writings became Christianity's creedal gene pool, the eternal realm, 
that is God's realm, ontologically distinct from the earth. So here we have uh, the reestablishment of kinds, right? We could say the heavenly and the earthly. Uh, is the most natural, the eternal realm is the most natural, while the finite world is a mere artifice. Again, she's dealing with Athanasius now. As a produced artifact and therefore likely to degenerate, the material uh, porosity, uh, that would be, you know, something that's porous, um, you know, it, it, things can flow in and out of it. The material porosity and solubility, the ability to dissolve, of corporeality. So she's saying that Athanasius had a very dim view of matter as having any real substance. Uh, it's, so it's uh, solubil, sol, soluble. It had to be prosthetically stayed. The porosity and solubility of corporeality had to be prosthetically stayed by fusion with the unchangeability of what was considered the most natural material, the uncorruptibility of pure spirit. That is one big sentence. Maybe you get the idea. I don't think she's wrong about Athanasius, by the way, and it wasn't just Athanasius alone. Although, you know, his, his heart was in the right place and he's trying to move in the right direction he did tend to say something like this. Uh, the material world, uh, what she's not including here is that he would say that sin, the power of sin is the corrosive element in the material world. I don't know that he would say that in and of itself, it's so uh, corruptible and, and melting away or you know degrading, but certainly because of sin, it is. So Athanasius basically argued God in mercy surely would not leave this creation of God's own making to like just sort of, uh, you know, uh, degrade away, uh, be, be destro destroyed by the acids of sin. So then she goes on to quote from uh, one of the people that was on her doctoral committee, uh, really fine church uh, historian or his, probably a historical theologian. Her name is Virginia Burris. Setting his sights upon the model of a recreation performed by the incarnation of Christ. So Christ, the incarnate divine word, is, the, is like the antidote to this acid of sin that's eating away at creation. Scholar of late antiquities, Virginia Burris explains, Athanasius expects the human subject to, to supersede his own natural mutability, his own natural, you know, uh, chain, changeableness and especially changing toward the worst, uh, corruptibility and, and uh, such, through the granted stability of divine incorruptibility. So the incorruptibility of the divine nature uh, in Jesus uniting with human nature uh, becomes like, again, the, the way through which human nature will be salvaged. The divinization or the godization of humanity thus comes in the guise, and notice that Burris puts a dis, the disguise of a put on, a cover up, a veil, shrouding the ebb and flow of bodily existence. Um, well, I'm going to finish. I want to keep these to no longer than 15 minutes each of these. So let me say this quickly. I'll tell you where uh, more could be said, and I think that this is correct. Athanasius, I'm going to say again, though he was had his heart in the right place and he was going in the right direction tended to think of the incarnation of the divine word as, as like the word um, entered into a human body, kind of like a hand into a glove. And, and so, and the glove would be, yeah, the, the human body, but no, not a human mind. Um, now, Athanasius didn't really pursue this very far, but it would be pursued by one of his students a little later smack dag uh, into heresy. But the, the point here that is correct is, I'm going to pause. <laughs>